Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, welcome to the uh, ASMA Center for Physics. As Emily said, uh, just very generously, I have been uh, on the general member for about eight years. I uh, come here very often because we all love Aspen, obviously. So um, uh, in particular, welcome to this uh, our free physics uh, uh, lecture. So this is sponsored by uh, Nick and uh, Maggie Wolf uh, Foundation. Their generosity makes this possible because our physicists and scientists to share our uh, research results and to with you. So this is our way uh, of uh, thanking the Aspen community and uh, for your support to this center. Today, uh, we are very happy to have this, uh, uh, our uh, uh, speaker, Professor Philip uh, Chang from the University of uh, Florida. So uh, Philip actually is um, a faculty assistant professor at uh, the University of Florida. And his uh, research is mainly on experimental particle physics. So he studies uh, the fundamental forces of nature in the, for the uh, fundamental building blocks for our nature as well. And he has been a member of uh, CMS. This is uh, a compact muon solenoid collaboration at uh, the Large Hadron Collider, one of the two uh, multi-purpose uh, uh, detectors. He's also involved, uh, he was before involved also with another uh, collaboration called Atlas. This is uh, one of the other two. Uh, um, uh, multi-purpose detectors to, to uh, measure all the fundamental properties and so on and so forth. Now, his major work has been on this, uh, the electric physics and also the Higgs boson physics. And uh, so we call it a so-called standard model. And uh, he has been also uh, developing the normal part particle track funding algorithm in particular to uh, make the connection with this, uh, the uh, uh, competition resource usage in high luminosity uh, LSC, averaging industry advancement uh, in the uh, computing and uh, artificial, artificial intelligence tactics. So, and uh, uh, Philip reminds me that uh, we first met uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, I was uh, at the University of Wisconsin at the faculty and he was a, a prospective graduate student to visit us. And uh, of course, at the very end, he decided not to join us at the University of Wisconsin. He went to UIUC, but uh, I'm very happy for his uh, development so far. So therefore, you can see that uh, this, uh, he's a, 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 a new generation fits our uh, program uh, this week. For many of us here sitting in the audience, we are here to uh, participate in one uh, physics conference program. The program is called The Future of High Energy Physics, New Generation and the New Vision. So uh, great. So we're going to uh, hear from this, uh, the new generation uh, physicist to tell us about uh, his uh, new, uh, new, uh, new vision. Um, I think uh, uh, the title for this, uh, the public lecture is uh, Invitation to imagine something from nothing. Let's see how we can uh, we can, co can comprehend that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, I was a prospective graduate student. I remember um, Tao actually told me to not go to University of Illinois. <laughs> I remember that, but. It, after that, we met a couple more times, and I was it was very um, rewarding to me as well as being being part of the new generation. Um, I started as an assistant professorship in a couple of years ago. Very thankful for the all of my family supports and all the people who have supported me throughout the career. And you know, now that I'm part of this uh, group, I wish um, I can talk a little bit about about what we've been doing and hopefully where we want to go in the next. So today, um, I'm going to be talking about a lot of it in the uh, empty space. What is in the empty space and what are the things that are there and what is it doing and why should we care? And that's the main thing of the uh, theme of the thing that I want to talk about. And the prerequisite for today is to have some imagination because a lot of the things that we do, I want to think the main difficulty in explaining to people is that it's not something that you can see. We're studying the things that are at a smallest scale and you can't see them, you can touch them, you can smell them. There's nothing that you can really feel directly, and only through large, you know, uh, machines and then, you know, a, a lot of energy that's, you, that you put into and an effort that you put into, and then you see some hints of them, and then you interpret these data and that's the only way you can see them. So once you have understood this, and then the thing that I'm going to talk about is only, a lot of it's going to be theoretical and a lot of it's going to be um, just words and explanations and a lot of abstract ideas. So I think today, one thing that I would really would like for you guys to have is to have some imagination. And when I talk about things to just kind of use your imagination to think what is out there in this world, and even though it may not seem like it. So this is the typical things that we talk about when we talk about 
what are we made of? And then in your class, probably chemistry class, we talked about these kind of periodic table of elements and it showed them that, that these are the things that are that we are made out of. Um, and for example, um, here is a molecule. I don't know, if, does anyone actually recognize what this is? <laughs> this is one of my favorite drugs. Exactly. Thank you. This is caffeine. <laughs> it's something that I can't operate without. And I've had some caffeine today as well. Um, and, but if you think about these picture and they tell you that these are atoms and you know, there's bondings, and these are the things that you learn in chemistry class. But one thing that probably didn't, they didn't tell you is that if you look at the one atom at a time, they're actually not stuffed. They're pretty empty. They're actually mostly empty. There's some stuff in the middle of the nucleus with the protons and neutrons, and electrons floating around. This is a picture of atoms that we understand these days. And in reality, though, the nucleus, the pictures of the atoms that you typically that people show you in terms of their model, is mm -hmm. also very wrong because they're not that big in terms of given the atom. They're actually about 99.39% uh, empty. So it's mostly empty. So, you know, this is the picture that we have. You have electrons running around, and then there's stuff in the middle, and basically most of the space that we are taking care of is empty. So here's a picture of that I took at my hotel today. Uh, there's a glass empty and a glass full. And what is the difference between them? There's very, very little difference. 0 0.12 and a 1% more filled on the right, uh, right side than the left. It's basically all empty space. So then it makes you wonder. So here's a picture of a snow mass. If I, for example, had a laser, if I were to shoot at it and try to hit the nucleus at a time or an electron, I could wave it around for well, my entire life and you would never hit anything. It's basically empty. It would be very, very unlikely that I would hit anything. And then I've done some back of the envelope calculation that if you want to have like a material and if you have a straight line and a hope that you will actually hit something, you need to go about 10 kilometers of stuff to be able to hit something because they're so small and most of them are empty. This is not exactly how it feels. And then you're sitting in your chair, not falling through it, right? Even though this is mostly 99.99% empty. You don't fall through. But the question is, why not? Why is it that we don't fall through? So why is it that things mostly empty don't just face through it, they actually bounce off? And the answer to this question is probably something also you learn in class as well. Anyone have any guess? Why is it that the things are not feeding through, but they don't go through? Electromagnetism. Electromagnetism, yes. The thing that you learn is that like charges repel, opposite charges attract, and then we turn we learned about like the plus plus positive charges when they're together close by, they will repel. They're plus and minus, so they will, you know, pull them together. The equation that people started sharing the equation today is the KQ1, Q2, or R square, where it says one charge, another charge, divided by how far they are apart, and then that runs how the strongly they're going to push. Another white lie here, that this is actually not true. You know, it works as an equation and then you can do the computation and then, but fundamentally speaking, it's not that the like charges are repelling each other. That is not the actual picture that we have in our mind. So the, th the things that you learn is electron, negative charge, negative charge, there's electromagnetic force and they will repel. Positive, like a proton and an electron, they will have a negative and a positive charge, and they will pull and attract and have a uh, attractive force. But if you think about it, it's not that the opposite charges attract because electrons don't have any eyes; they don't look any; they, they don't have any consciousness. It's not that the electrons understand there is a proton sitting next to me, that that I need to feel a force to go there. Electrons are basically you know, is unconscious as far as we know. <laughs> and so that they, they won't be able to see things around them. What's really happening, and the thing that we re really is happening is that if you have a proton and a positive charge like this, it, it spans an entire, the entire universe. It fills with the, what we call the electromagnetic field. The field that fills the entire space and this field is going, the, the positive proton charge is going to create some sort of a field 
and then the where the electron is sitting on this field relative to that, that's what it's going to feel, and that's what feel the force. What is this field? This is kind of like the picture you've seen probably from your magnets when you have a magnet and you put some iron dust, creates these lines. So even though it looks empty around the space, around the map bar magnet, there are things around it. Those are the, those are the things I say field. When you have positive charge and a negative charge, it's going to create field around the whole space. And that's what charges see where I'm sitting on, if I'm the charge, that I look at the field and if it's in a certain shape, and that's what I follow. Not that there is something there and I somehow I know it. That's that that is a picture that we have. And so electromagnetic force is going to be felt by this uh, electron because of the field that was created by the proton. And all that they really needs, the electron needs to care is what is around it. Locally, what's around me, what are the things that I feel if I'm the electron. If there's a slope on it, that's the way that the, the force is going to appear. Charges feel force due to the field. And so if I come back to this picture again, so instead of that, it's actually empty space. The imagination that I would like you to have is that this is really just filled with fields everywhere. Because these charges are going to create fields in the entire space, it's going to be filled with them. This is a typical picture that we have as a particle physics in terms of when we think about it. That it's not some particles, but it's the fields that are permeating through the space. Another thing that you may have heard in your chemistry class is the electrons are particles that are moving around in the picture that we show. Another thing that um, uh, we have uh, understood is that the electrons are the ones that are responsible for these uh, things around the atom. That's what's going to push back. However, the electrons are also uh, particles, but they're also field. And this is another thing that we have in the last uh, uh, 100 years that we have learned is that particles themselves are also not some kind of an object of a takes up a space, but it really just a field. What does I mean by that? All the electrons in my body and in your body, in the chair, in everything, it's really an excitation, it's a ripple of the electron field that's permeating through the entire universe. There's only one electron field in the universe. It fills the entire space, and the ripples of these electron fields are the ones that's creating uh, these little particle-like uh, object. And this quantum field theory picture of it, one of the things that we learn is that the energies are not continuous. So they have a photon, and amount of, if you put one amount of energy to create one electron, and that's one amount of energy that you have. If you have two, three, and then those are the, the uh, electrons that we call them the particles. So see, bundle of energy or the ripples of these electron fields, and that's what we call the electron. So only one electron field in the universe. So in some sense, we're all getting some, in ways we're connected because all of the electrons ripple to the same exact electron field. So um, the picture of these forces with the uh, um, electrons, you know, repelling each other, the way that we want to think about it is that the electromagnetic field is another type of quantum field that's permeating through every space. There's also the electron field. And if you create an electron, if you put two electrons in that, it's kind of like the ripples in this electron field. And that's what, what we're representing by the electrons there. If you have an electron, it's going to also create some kind of a, some kind of a ripple in the electromagnetic field. So electron field, it's permeating through the entire space, have some ripples, and that ripple is going to then affect the electromagnetic field through the rules of the quantum mechanics and the quantum field theory. And so the, the, the fact that the electron is here is going to affect the, how the electromagnetic field looks like. And so if, for example, if I had an electron, if I move it around and get around, it's going to create a sort of an excitation, some sort of ripple in the electromagnetic field. And that will also then create another sort of bundle of energy. That's what we call a photon. And so a light can come out if you have an electron that are moving. That would propagate through space. And if it hits the another electron, in that space, in that area, that electromagnetic field will then affect the electron, and maybe it'll move. And those are the way that we understand in terms of particle physics. So really, it's not a particle, 
It's all just the field and then the, it ripples in the, electro, uh, in the fields. Fundamental building blocks of nature. So this is sort of a new kind of periodic table that I can tell you. But really, it's not a fundamental building blocks of nature, but it's really a fundamental building fields of nature. Because the fields are the one that we have to identify. And one thing that we know is the electron. Electron fields are permeating through the entire space, as we know. And think about the other particles that we know. The atom, there's a protons and neutrons. And there are two more fundamental fields that makes us. One is what's called the up quark field, and the other is what's called a down quark field. With the electron field, up quark field, down quark field, with the excitations and these ripples in those fields, you can have a bundle of energies, what you can call them particles. If you have two up quarks and a one down quark, that will be what we call the proton. If you have one up quark and two down quarks, that's what we will call a neutron. And those bundle of energies of particles, you put them together, and that's what's going to make the nucleus. And then those nucleus around them with the electrons, those are the, how you can make an atom. And the entire periodic table that you learn in chemistry, you don't have to memorize any of them, just memorize electron, up quark, and down quark, and that's everything that you can make. And any, anything that you see around you, everything can be made out of electrons and up quark and down quark. Those three fundamental building fields, those are the one that you can use to make anything that you see around you. So these are the fundamental building fields, as I said, electron, up quark, and down quark. Now, this was a sort of the idea, of, this is the amount of things that we mostly see. However, we did the experiments to try to understand better. We found a lot more. We don't really know why. There are more stuff, more fields, arm, strange, top and bottom, and we have these weird names muons, tau, neutrinos, all of these things are fundamental fields and you don't really need them to create anything that you see here in this room. However, they do exist. We did find them. We're not entirely sure why yet. But these are uh, 12 fields that makes up um, all the stuff that you can create. And then there are more forces also, and you probably have heard about things like strong force and the weak force. And what are they? The electromagnetic force is when you have a proton and electron charges are reacting to each other. And we talked about that those are um, electromagnetic fields are the ones that get um, uh, the ripple that uh, affects the protons and the electron fields that affects the electromagnetic fields. And when you have a ripple on that electromagnetic fields, those are what we call the photon. Strong force is related to the force between the nucleus of, of protons and neutrons. And one of the other two forces, like the strong and weak force, is not something that we really experience very much. Uh, with the things that we really experience in, in our lives and in, you know, in everyday life is really electromagnetic force, and that's about it and gravity. A strong force is also very important because if you think about the nucleus, the protons are very, very in a fixed spot. If they are positively charged, they should really try to repel. They don't repel but because there are other kinds of fields that bind them together, and we call them the gluon. It's a gluon field, and then the ripples in the gluon fields are sending the forces between the protons and neutrons. They're bind, they're, then they can be bound together. There's another force called a weak force, where you would turn one of the down quark into an up quark by shooting out an electron. And so the, the down quark fields can ripple then it can affect one of the W or the Z field. We really uh, ran out of idea in terms of naming them, so we just give them letters. Um, and W and the Z fields. And then the W and the Z fields in, in, in return then affects the electron fields and the neutrino fields, and then it can create electron and neutrino, and then there is, this is a way we understand. So there's all these fields, including the 12 plus the more, four more, and those are the 16 fields that we have, and that's how we understand it. One thing that's not on here is the gravity. Um, I think Newton uh, found dropping of the apple to find this. And, and of course, the other forces are very useful because you can power, uh, you, you can create power, electricity and everything that we do and, every, and whatnot. Also, if you drop the apple, um, it will cost you a million dollars. So these are the 16 fields that we have, and this is what we call the standard model. And we have the 12 fields, and then we have the four fields that are related to the forces, misty. Interactions between these fields are what's making us. 
So we're mostly made out of empty spaces. We're also filled 100% by fields. And it's the ripples on these fields, the ones that make us. Now, these fields, um, you when you create the uh, bundle of energy, um, then you have a what we call the particle. And that's what probably it's easier for us to understand as sort of like a particle and like think of it like a ball. And those things have, uh, each of these particles have some masses. Um, and some of them are light, some of them are heavy. And for example, electron is light and it has an electron mass and up quark and down quark are the ones that we, you know, every day that we make. Those are, you know, around similar kind of sizes of mass. They're pretty light. The other particles that we've also found and the other particles that are important to in, in, in our nature, and they are, they're very different ranging values of mass. What do you mean by mass is that if you have something and you apply a force, how much does it resist your force? And that's the fundamental idea of what we call a mass, because if you apply a stronger force and it's accelerating faster, that would have a, le a less of a mass. If you apply a lot of force, but then it's resisting your force in terms of your changing in your speed, that's what we call it has a large mass. Some of the particles have a really, really large mass compared to the electrons. So if I apply the same amount of force like uh, on electrons that I was applying onto another thing, it will be very, very much more heavy. This is a picture of what we call the center model. It's been very, very successful. The theory is very complicated. I'm not a theorist, um, but the theory and the calculations are very, very complicated and it's very hard. Um, but then people have done a lot of jobs on this and then the uh, theory community has done great work in calculating all these things and making predictions. I want to show you one prediction here. It's one of the uh, things that we can do when you have one proton and another proton, and then you smash them together as, as hard as you can. And all these up quark, down quark, uh, and I know, and by now I hope you understand that I've shown you this little particle, but there are really fields. And those, when those fields are pushed into one spot, and all these energies that are bundled up and can create ripples in the other fields and through the rules of the quantum field theory and rules with this complicated rules, can create other kinds of particles from this, all these other 16 fields that I've talked about. And one of the most copious things that happens is when the two protons get smashed together, it produces a bunch of stuff in one direction, the other direction. And we call them the jets. Now, I wanted to show you that this is an event um, that we, uh, uh, this is an uh, experiment that we've done many, many times over. If you look at the uh, the vertical scale, it ranges from very small values to very, very high value, and all across a very large number of orders of magnitude. The red line is a theory. All the black dots are the the dots are the the data points. You can see that across a very large number of orders of magnitude have a very good prediction and they really agree very well. The bottom plot also shows you line of the, uh, the, the theory predictions. And then there's a band and the, if the data points are within them, then you would say that the theories are working well. And given the uncertainty error bars on the data, we can see that they're on a very good agreement. So it's an, ex it's a theory that works extremely well. And this is just one example of it. And we have, Thousands of papers that came out, or each atlas of CMS uh, that came out, and then we have done this test many times over, and this theory has been working very well. This is an extremely, extremely great uh, theory. It has been work uh, It's a remarkable achievement that human has done in terms of understanding the fundamental nature of what we are made of. It's these sixteen fields. Now, I talked about this uh, the theory, and it's that is very, very successful. There's actually one thing um, that I'm missing out on this is that in order for that theory to work, that all that equation that I showed you, there was actually one more thing that in the, that the theorists had to add to make it all work. It's just that the, the theory is very hard. I mean, it's, you know, it's a lot of work that needs to be done. And in order for it to actually agree with all this data that we just showed, there's one more particle that had to be existing in addition to all these other ones. And the 1980s, by the 1980s and such, uh, we uh, and then in early uh, mid 1990s or so, all these other 16 fields were found. But the Higgs boson was missing. So, what is the Higgs boson and why is it important? So, that's one thing that I wanted to talk to you about. So, I've shown you that these are these masses here. 
one thing that the standard model theory without the Higgs boson is that all of these masses values, they all have to be zero. That we cannot have the theory work unless everything's zero mass. If you think about the implication of that, if the field of these, ma of these uh, 16 fields I was talking about, of the, all of them are just like mass massless, and then that means we'll all be flying around in the speed of light, and there's no wave as the universe is evol evolving into this point that they have a time to be able to create any kind of matter because they can't be bound together to create any atoms, any other material matters and everything that we see. In some sense, without the Higgs, uh, Higgs field to be able to explain these masses, in some sense, we have a very fundamentally flawed understanding of how we, all of us came to be because without them, it would all have to be mass, uh, massless. So, um, how do, we, how do we explain this? So Higgs, if the Higgs field is added, because we're following the same rule, it means that throughout the entire space, the Higgs field will have to be um, filling everywhere. And it follows the basic of the same rule. If you were to some sort of ripple, it would be creating particle from the Higgs field, and we would call them the Higgs boson. Now, the way that we understand uh, how things are massless and massive is by through this way. If the Higgs field has a zero value, it's just quiet everywhere in the universe. And all the particles that were supposed to be massless, it's going to stay massless. They're all going to be flying out in like speed of light, and nothing's going to interesting is going to really be happening. All these particles that I've shown you, there's three lines from three different kinds of fields. If there were to be like a um, electromagnetic field uh, um, ripple, then you have a photon. If you have an electron field ripple, then you may have some electron particles. All these things will be flying out in a speed of light and up quark, down quark, and everything will be just, you know, flying out in a speed of light. And then they would have not be creating any kind of protons or neutrons or atoms or any of these periodic elements and anything like that. However, um, what way that we've explained is that if this Higgs field, if this Higgs field with this the rules that are written in this theory, that Higgs field were to have a value that are non-zero everywhere, they are Instead of sitting at a calm value, they're like an erased value, some different non-zero value. And it's kind, it's it's like filled with this Higgs field values. And a particle a certain has a sort of a the, the ripples of these particles have some rules that affect the Higgs field and then and then back and forth. This interaction between the electron field, for example, and the Higgs field. If that field the interaction is strong, and it would have a lot. As it's going through in the space, it would have to be interacting a lot, many, many times with the Higgs field. Therefore, it sort of slows down. That is a way that, you know, one way of understanding how, where the mass comes from. So if something is not really re interacting, if, even if you ripple the electron field, but it didn't really affect the Higgs field, then that uh, field would have a particle that has a light mass. But if you have another field, like a top quark, you know, one with the highest, one of the highest mass. If that field were to be rippling, and the top quark, if that field were to, when it ripples, it has a stronger reaction to the Higgs field, then that would have a more uh, a heavier uh, interaction. It would it would be uh, it would have a higher a, heavy, a heavier mass. That's one way of understanding how um, we can do this. So. If there is such a thing, but right now in this space as well, the Higgs field is existing, this room, and that it has a value that is non-zero and has some different values from a zero, it also means that if you put energy into this little portion, and then if you can somehow create a ripple on this Higgs field, you may be able to create another particle from the Higgs field. That would be what we call the Higgs boson particle. If you can find that particle, and if you can see particle from a detector and you would prove the existence of this kind of such a Higgs field and then you've proved this Higgs field then maybe we can understand how we got all the masses and from for these 16 fields so that is um, what we have done in the um, CERN at the Large Hadron Collider and this is uh, about 10 years ago this is when we made the discovery and then to the Nobel Prize and I thought it was interesting actually when I was this article out there was a it said Espen Colorado in the bottom here 
I did not know this actually. I've seen this article many, many times for the last 10 years. I never noticed this. <laughs> and that was interesting. Um, but but that was what we discovered, and it really proved the point of that the Higgs field um, exists. Now, however, though, the picture, and since then we've been, and I want to tell you what's, what we've been working since then. Higgs field exists, okay, fine, great, we can explain it, the, you know, everything's great, you know, we done? Well, I think the fact that the Higgs field is, has a non-zero value is very unnatural. Because think about it like a lake, a calm lake. You know, you can think of it as an, as an analogy. So think of it as like a, a lake of a field. I'm really saying it's something like this. It's raising some value. If you walk around and are hiking around and you find that this whole body of water is <laughs> offset by some value, and then you look at that and you think, wow, that can explain all these, you know, important things about the, you know, other fundamental uh, things about the physics. Wait, and now I'm just, you, know, you wouldn't be just walking away. You will want to know what is going on. And in order to understand this, we need to understand, you know, what the Higgs uh, field is doing. And the one thing that the Higgs field is special is that when you create these kinds of ex uh, ripples in this Higgs field, then it create a Higgs boson. And imagine you have created another one. There is some self-interaction. Higgs field will interact with it on itself. It's actually one of a kind of a thing. All the other fields that we know, they don't do anything like that. All the other fields that we know so far that we have discovered it's only been such that if you have a one field rippling, then you got to have another field that are being uh, affected by it. This field is the only one that we know, in terms of the theory. We ripple something and then you create a uh, Higgs boson. It would actually then affect on, on itself. But it's kind of like this, due to the fact that there's a bit of a self-interaction, why you can explain that things can be offset like this. If you imagine you started with zero, you ripple the things around and it will self-interact. So it's kind of like it, they, they want to be sort of rate affecting on each other such that the field values are everywhere are sort of be offset by some value. This is not something that we have seen before. This is a very brand new thing. We haven't proved that yet. We've only seen that it exists. We don't know the mechanism of what's going on in terms of why it's being filled up like this. We don't know exactly why this field is offset by some value. Those are the things that we are very interested in. And so, so we made some progress of understanding it and we got to the uh, uh, the peak and then now we made it you know, to some point and then now we're looking at it and we're like, oh, there's new, new frontiers, we gotta go even further. And so this is where we are now. And so I um, mean, two years ago, many other friends in this room as well, we've uh, met at the University of Washington, although it's called Snow Mass, but it's not here. <laughs> <laughs> it used to be here, I think, um, but um, I'm a new generation, and I guess you know we don't meet in, in here anymore. But uh, in the University of Washington, we met um, more than thou around thousand, I think, uh, people met together, and then we've discussed where do we go now, and how, what's the best way to go forward. So we've painstakingly discussed it, debated, you know, what's the best way forward, and just a few months ago, we had a, a very a big report about what are the things that we want to prioritize and then going forward to answer these kinds of questions. One of the things, one I just showed you, like why is it that it's, the Higgs field is off like that? That's one of the fundamental things that we want to understand now. And um, this report had a endorsements from three, over 3,000 of physicists together from the or in the U.S. community and, and even more. And it was also covered by New York Times, came out uh, and one of the things of an idea that was proposed that I just want to highlight is that uh, um, uh, is, is called a muon collider idea that could happen in the Chicago area. And the title here, if you see particle physics agree on a roadmap for the next decade, that's what the, the report was talking about. And we got <laughs> the plan of, uh, of the wordplay of a moonshot, uh, a muon shot, because it's like muon is the one type of field that I was talking about. And then if you were to collide muons, it's something that would be a good idea to be able to probe these kinds of questions. Of course, um, don't know exactly which way to go, um, how to get there the best way. We are currently in the, at this point, 
I would like to see where we can go forward in the future. Um, but that is where we are now. Before I end, I want to ask um, all of you who are part of this snow mess process as well. I know many of you are here. If you can kind of maybe stand up for just a second. Um, I'm sorry to put you in the spot because I'm not, I, I don't want to be the only one in the spot. I know you guys are here. I just wanted to have you guys look around and this is a community of people that are working together. This is not the kind of science that we do one person just going alone. This is the science where we have to work together. And this is the reason why we've been here meeting together. There's the experiments that we do are very large scale and we work together. And so um, I'm really happy to see this report and I have a, a common view. You can sit down by the way, <laughs> yes. um, common view. And I'm, I'm very grateful for the th uh, all the friends and everyone who um, have been helping me as well on the way. So that's uh, what I wanted to talk about today. Thank you. So I think we have time for some more questions. Yeah, you can go ahead. You know, you're showing these fields. They look like they're two dimensions with the dip maybe three. How many dimensions do they really have? Um real yeah, it's it's really three plus time, so four. Um yeah, so I, I you know, I can't I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so I'm showing you only a two D version, even a one D version you probably noticed that there was a line that I've but it's really representing it's really filling up the entire space. And it's not a, at a certain time it exists and it just goes away. It's like it's there all the time. And so it's a three dimension plus the time. Yeah. Sex in the three dimensional world. Yeah. So all the fields exist in every space, everywhere. And one ripple in a one field will affect the other one. They're all filling up an entire space in the same place. Then any work to disrupt these fields? Is that what the Philadelphia experiment was, where they presumably merged humans with a warship? Was that real? Are we disrupting these fields and making matter intertwined? Not sure what that experiment. Oh, uh, the question was: Is has there been an experiment to disrupt these fields? And I'm not aware of this experiment in Philadelphia. I'm not sure which route. Well, it's both in a movie, and it, it said it was a secret government. Yes, correct. Information. Let's be something from never check or invention. Okay, I'm 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 sorry. I'm not aware of that one. But it is, in some sense, we are, in some sense, just trying to disrupt this field. So fields are everywhere. It, sometimes it may not have any ripple. If it has a ripple, then you know that might be shown to us as like a particle. What we do is if you have one particle, which is a sort of a ripple, and another particle, and then you push them together into one spot, and then it would collide together and create a lot of energy in one spot, that ripple will then affect the other fields following the rules and that it can then uh, create other kinds of matter. And that's what we do in our, uh, in our, um, glider experiments where we have one proton and another proton and we smash them together in one really, really tiny spot. And then so that we, all of these energies can be put into one place, that energy is going to do some ripples. And then among these 16 fields, some of them are going to get uh, affected by it following the quantum mechanical rules. So it's sort of a, uh, uh, bring out a dice uh, probabilistically. Then when that happens, some of these things, some new things can be popping out. Other ripple can come out. Those are the things that we do in terms of when we see disrupting, we would do a collision like that. Yeah, we're not merging a teacup or anything like that. No, not that I'm aware of. Kitty, what is quantum entanglement and how does it relate to the forces in the standard theory? So the question was, what is quantum entanglement and how does it affect with relate relate the forces in the standard theory. Uh, how does it relate to the forces in this theory? Um, quantum entanglement is related to the fact that I was talking about. There's only one electron field, as I as I mentioned, for example. But uh, if you have a ripple in one spot, another ripple on the other spot, um, the specific wave of these ripples can be in many different ways. If you have one electron and another electron, they can be somehow 
shape of this ripple can be connected or sometimes it can be not connected. If a specific version of like, for example, like a two electron, they may be, uh, have a specific sort of a, a ripple where if you were to disrupt one of them, it would affect the other. That's when we say quantum entanglement, when you have two particles that are entangled to each other in their sort of call it in existence, that if you were to, even if they are far apart, once you create them and they're moving apart for a long distance, that if you were to disrupt this part of the field, it would immediately then affect somewhere very, very far apart. It would affect you know, and the other one. That is what a quantum entangled state is. And so whether the, it's related to the force in the theory, I'm not sure, or probably not, but it's, it's, the, it's the specific sort of these states, this uh, shape of these ripples that can be um, connected to each other, even though there's two parts of energy, the electrons in a, in a different spot. And then the, the really the fundamental reason for that being entangled is that it's only one electron field. And so, be, you know, if there's only one thing and it's a ripple of those, it's like a wave in an ocean. It's still an ocean, right? You have multiple waves are in your ocean, but they're all still part of one ocean. It's, it's kind of like that. And so that's why they can be entangled. They can affect uh, in each other. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a literary person, so all this is real, really new to me. I'm trying to wrap my head around uh, your fields are in the universe. You all relate to the Big Bang. Big Bang was when all of this started, all of these fields. So the fields have a, a finite a dimension to them. Oh. So because it, it's got to begin something, right? Um, uh, what's the current thinking on that one? So, right, the, the question was um, fields uh, are, are so the things happen in the Big Bang, it feels what have been have to exist somewhere in the beginning. And then the question was, if it all started with the Big Bang, how far does this field extend? Right? Is that sort of the question, maybe? Uh, is it, is it, it, does it have to be finite? Does it have to be finite? If, if so, then there's a, a like a dimension to the universe. Okay. Like the size of a universe, you mean? Yeah, like, that, and it all of those back to uh, the bang and the idea of there being nothing in front of it, yeah. you know, um, that's what I'm trying to. Uh, oh, yeah. I, it's a good question. I, I'll give you an answer. And, and since I'm not a, a theorist in terms of cosmology, I might be giving you a wrong answer. So you know, there are people here who are more, you know, much more better at, uh, as you can talk to them. Or if you can, somebody can help me out, that'd be great too. But okay, I'll give it a try though. So our current best understanding of it is that the Big Bang, it's not some size small and there's like outside this big, that that's, there's like some boundary of the end of the universe. Our current understanding is that the entire infinitely large universe is crumpled up into one single spot. I can't fully comprehend that either, uh, but there's mathematically you can show that. <laughs> I, can, I, I believe math, but like, you know, in terms of like what I really feel, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I, I, I it, you know, the, with, the, with the imagination that I have, it's still a little hard for me to grasp it, um, but that's our current understanding. So fields, I don't know exactly whether these fields, the very beginning of the Big Bang, you know, point, like how would it look like? Is it the same kind of fields? Is it just, or, or different fields start? That is something that, um, I think it's still an unknown, uh, unexplained question because we have, we don't have a good experimental way of probing that far back of what was happening then. Um, we're, we have many sort of indirect way of looking at it, um, but it's right now with the the experiments that we're doing, we're not going back that far. Or we're a little bit after the Big Bang happened and things, you know, sort of settled down a little bit. So um, I then. We have the universe that, are, uh, as far as we can understand, is like infinitely you know, large, and the fields that we understand, and then the theory that we understand, is that it's expanding all the way through. There's no uh, finite dimension, but there's no like an end, to the boundary. Well, what determines the how strongly the X field interacts with the other particles? That uh, can you determine that from theory, or is it on pure metal? It is uh, the question was um, how 
the, the how strong does the other fields interact with the Higgs field, um, and what determines that? Is there some theory that can predict you know what the values are? I think that was a question. Um, I, I think it's a free parameter in the theory, and that we would have to measure them. Um, there are some relations to them, though. Like some fields and other fields that they have to follow certain rules. So there are some relations between, oh, if you have this field with certain mass, you should have this kind of interaction, you know, strength. The other fields that has a different mass and they have to be. So there's some relation between them. But like the exact value of them, um, understanding is that you, you, need, uh, you need to measure them. And then, because um, it's a free parameter in the theory, you would have to measure them and then, you know, uh, and then put into the theory to make sure that that's what it is. And then if measure one thing and you measure another thing you plug into theory and the relation doesn't work and that would be an, an opening to a finding new theory because then it would say that the theory broke down okay. um, so you showed the bar magnet and the magnetic field that is generated by that magnet is it a reasonable question to, to ask what is generating these other fields or do we just take it that they exist. We don't know why, we won't ever know why. A uh, very good question. Like where do the fields come from in some sense, right? Um, so in terms of the picture that I told you, if I rehash that, yes, it's it's there. <laughs> and I just take it for granted that there's an electromagnetic field that is permeating through this entire space. It's just filled everywhere. It's this fluid-like substance, you know, you know, all the dimension and three dimension, um, it's filled there. Where does it come from and like what it is it that originated it? That's a big question. That is a question that we want to answer in some time in the future. Um, I think it'll it'll be quite hard, but that is definitely a question that we are asking as well. Other questions? Did you go that? Um, just in terms of like conceptualizing uh, the ripples or waves within a field, like specifically talking about the electron field, you drew it as like an inverted parabola in this diagram. Um, and it makes me think like the way I conceptualize electrons in like energy levels, it would be like a single point above the field. But when you draw it as a parabola, it makes me think that there's like something outside of that energy level or in between the energy levels. Yeah. Um, so does the upside down parabola actually make sense? And is there like a trail off of that parabola or is there uh, like an excitation the question was, uh, I drew the electron field and the excitation of it as some sort of like an inverted parabola, but it makes it feel like there's some in-between values. But the, the usual understanding of the electrons is it, it should take up some energy in sort of a steps, right? So the question was like, is this excitation of the, ex ex uh, of the exciting of these elect electron field like a continuous thing or not? Um, quick answer to that is that my drawing is a very illustrative <laughs> drawing and it does not bear um, full reality. I was just trying to explain it as more of a ripple in the, in the electron uh, field. Uh, it's, it's definitely true that if you think about it in this kind of context as this ripple, uh, the, it, 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 in terms of the space that I was showing you, the, I would say that the more correct the thing in terms of that refers to the energy is how fast these things are vibrating. Um, because it's, this is a sort of a space and, and to say something has higher energy as in like higher, um, movement or momentum or kinetic energy and things like that, those are usually represented by the, how fast the waves are moving. And so, um, the picture of this with the size going up and down, that is not necessarily directly related to the energy at all. And so that's a quick answer, but you know, the real answer is that this does not really, really compare the uh, reality, but it's just sort of an illustration of the point that the electron field, there's a ripple to it. That's how we understand we, what we mean by electron. Great. Any other questions? Yes, go ahead. So I think mine's more of a process question. I'm just interested in the evolution of how these physicists are thinking. So you collected a bunch of data points from these magnetic fields and, and came up with that insanely complex mathematical equation. But the mathematical equation didn't work unless you had a Higgs, a, something that's a Higgs field. 
how do you know that the math, since the mathematical equation was uh, derived, I'm assuming, from hard data, how, how, how do you know that that's correct in order to surmise that there must be this Higgs field to verify that equation? And when you tell me that you know it's correct and so there has to be a Higgs field, what if it's not one Higgs field? What if it's 10 fields? that may that you may later find i am just curious okay so i will repeat the question i it is a very interesting question i have to say um it was a question about the process of how we got to this point and then the, your question was um the higgs field we didn't know it before but there were some data that we had in terms of that we've collected through various experiments and we've devised this equation then we had to add this one more higgs field to it uh, to explain the rest of it sure but i think your question was how do we know that what we have done, understanding that all the math that we put together up to that point was correct? Like, how do we know that, okay, so this thing here, and then we found a Higgs field, but how do we know that, that this is complete in the sense that could it, could other kinds of Higgs fields could have also added into this theory, could have also explained it? All the question, it, the quick answer is yes. We don't know for sure. All the things that we have done in the past and all the things that we have collected and, and the, the, the steps that we have made, there's one more step forward of seeing this. It's just a part of the process of scientific process. And you know all the things that we've discovered, there's always a chance that someday we find something new and that what we have understood before could be uh, not to be incorrect. So the answer is yes. We don't know 100% for sure that that is correct. It's just that the, all the theories and all the other experiments and all the things that we have tried, we all seem to agree and so we have some confidence that it's good. Is it 100%? No, absolutely not. And yes, there are many theorists who are asking the question, is this the only one? It's a really weird one that we've added into this. And then there's a very natural question. And all the things that are talked about in this report, it mentions exactly that. Is there more? Is it exactly, literally, I'm just like probably quoting it. Is there more? Is this the only one? Um, are there more? And like, could it be there are more, 10 more Higgs fields? So that's exactly the kind of the question that we're trying to do answer. And so um, the report really prioritized some of the future projects that could potentially answer those questions. Right. This is sort of a follow-up on this woman's question. When it comes first, the mathematical operation or the general function? Uh, it really comes together, in my opinion. Um, it's not one or the other. There are certain cases when real surprises in terms of the experiment happens, and then it has happened in the past, then that would then say, hey, the things that we've written down before doesn't seem to work, or we need to reinvent or add more uh, equations to them to explain that. So, and then there's also the question of consistency of the logic within the just the working of the mathematical theory. If something doesn't work mathematically, like one plus one is not equal to two, then it's that the, our understanding of it just logically doesn't make sense, right? So it's both ways. And so in, in the theory world, you can put together the things that we know, and given what we have understood and accepted as uh, true, and again, with the confidence that it's not 100% confidence, but with a good, a good confidence because it's supported by the data, then you put them together and then mathematically say, oh, it doesn't fit well. You need to add another portion of it. And there are many, probably there's many possibilities to explain it. One of those things could be uh, a possibility of explaining it. And then the, th the experimentalist hears that, says, oh, I see that so you may have to add one more field to it, for example. Then let me go and see if I can devise an experiment that would excite these new field and see if I can create it in a lab. If I try this over and over again, if I don't see it, then the theorist will hear that news and say, maybe it's not the right one. And we'll, they'll try another sort of a scenario, like you know, one Higgs field or two Higgs field. But it's really going together. Sometimes we do the experiment, and what we thought was working we just completely break down. Some other places we've tried it in a different way, and then what we thought was working, it just turns out it was not. Those are the, that would be the kind of a situation where we found that we had a high confidence that it was working. Somehow we find out that it's actually not working. Then that re then re it uh, gives a feedback back into the theory community. And then they say, oh, that one didn't work. Although we thought that it was working for decades, then they have to uh, start thinking about where would it be that we have to modify it, add something. So it's really going in tandem together. 
not one, uh, but it's always sort of like working together in that sense. As a non-science question, but it is science related. Uh, I met a New York painter once, very famous, who described his career as being part of an ongoing conversation that began centuries before he was born and will go on centuries after. Given the fact that a lot of your work will never will never get to knowing everything in your lifetime, how do you view your career and then your place in the career in your time frame in your life? Do you frame it in any way? Do you see it as, how would you describe that? Wow. <laughs> I love this question. <laughs> <laughs> right. The question. I think the question. Uh, the question. I think, if I can shortly rephrase it, I think it's the, it's about. You know, my life is short, <laughs> um, and the things in terms of the science progress, it usually happens in a very long time scale. Right? It's like sometimes it happens in a century, once in a century discovery, or things like that. So then, it something that's as exciting as like yeah, you know once in a century kind of thing that doesn't happen for me like you know how do i see my career how do i i guess it's a question like how do i motivate myself to to, to go towards this you even think about this do i even think about this yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely i do think about this um i think it's the uh, deep appreciation of understanding of this nature is what drives me at the end it's the fact that I may not make another big discovery. I was very fortunate and lucky to be part of this explosion discovery. And and you know, I, and when I say lucky, I'm not like trying to like humble myself or anything. I really, I mean lucky because I was born just at the right time where the people were thinking about doing this ten billion ten billion dollar experiment in the mid '90s. I was learning how to add numbers then. I was learning how to multiply numbers. I had no idea of it any of this thing, but there were a group of generation who was saying, maybe it's not for me, but maybe for the future generation that they were thinking about this and preparing this experiment. I grew up, I learned about physics, and I get interested in this because I just want to understand. I go to high school, I go to college, and then I, right the moment when I head to grad school, this experiment started. It was just the right time. Not only that, <laughs> This experiment, if you look back and if you look up the, the history of it, in 2009 or 8, it blew up. And it had a one-year delay of the whole thing. I joined just at the right time, meeting with Tao, <laughs> in the, you know, discussing about where to go for graduate school, but just at the right time, such that when I joined the collaboration, exactly one year after they had a discovery, the one year was the, our authorship uh, sort of a due that we have to do the work to be part of the authorship. My ex literally, my first paper that I wrote was the Higgs and discovery. <laughs> the level of lucky <laughs> that the luck that I have to have to to be part of this is just enormous. I think so. I, I find it incredibly lucky, but it really happened because the future, the the previous generation thought about it. Even if they, I'm sure some of the people who thought of this idea of doing this to search for this Higgs boson. Um, probably may not have been part of it by the time I was uh, working on it. The similar things about all these things that we're talking about this, you know, future next decade, you know, the things that we're talking about this Muon shot, it may happen by the time I, maybe I retire. And I mean, I, you know, all these great discovery that potentially could come, I may not even be part of it. But the reason I still do this and all the friends that I have here, the friends is to working together, creating something beautiful, working together, having the deep appreciation of what we understand, making that one little step you know, having more and more understanding of it is what drives me. And then the fact that I can go and talk to my students uh, in my cl in my class, I can, you know, motivate them as well. And I'll talk to public like this in the public lecture, which I really love to do, and then talk to people. And then so that we can, I can you know, disseminate information about what we learn and what we how we understand what we are and what we, so those are the things uh, I think that drives me. I do think about it, of course. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So let's have one more question. I think in the future um, we'll be able to simulate those huge experiments with computers without actually colliding stuff. Oh, uh, if we are talking about simulation of our expectation of what we might see, we're already doing it. So we have computers to do this. Of course, sometimes the computers hits the boundary and we can't. We don't have enough computing powers to do it. Um, and you know we have to chug along or have to. Wait a long time, you know, twiddle our thumb, waiting for the computers to end, uh, end the simulation. Uh, but we can do it in just some level. But can we discover new things with that? No. 
because the only way we can find out what's true or not is to really cite the fields in the nature. If computer simulation won't be able to do it because computer simulation will only do what we tell them to do. And what we understand is only going to be what, we're, what it's going to give us back. And so we can do the experiment. We can try different scenarios and see what kind of experiment it'll turn out to be and then put together some ideas of, okay, how do we best do this? That's exactly what we uh, had this you know, report is about. So all these simulation studies together and said, I mean, this is probably the best strategy to go forward. But we won't be able to discover something like entirely new because only way to do that is to actually try it in the lab stuff, cite the fields, and then see if you can see the ripples of it. Well, 